Planescape Torment opens up with a scarred man waking on a mortuary slab, robbed of his memory, and with very little information as to how he came to be there beyond a cryptic message tattooed on his back, inked as instructions to himself. He's even forgotten his own name. Almost immediately, he's approached by a floating skull called Mort, who offers advice on how to escape and reads the tattoos written on the nameless one's back. The message describes a journal that will help him remember important details, as well as a man he must seek out, Farad, who will fill him in on the rest of the details. This journal, it seems, is missing, probably stolen. So the nameless one, given no other choice, decides to leave without any idea about what he was doing before he awoke or why. On the way out, his first clues are given by an old scribe named Dahl and the ghost of the nameless one's former lover, Deonara, who gives him a prophecy. You shall meet enemies three, but none more dangerous than yourself in your full glory. They are shades of evil, of good, and of neutrality, given life and twisted by the laws of the plains. You shall come to a prison built of regrets and sorrow, where the shadows themselves have gone mad. There you will be asked to make a terrible sacrifice, my love. For the matter to be laid to rest, you must destroy that which keeps you alive and be immortal no longer. The Nameless One then steps out of the mortuary and into Sigil, the city of doors, and the hub of the great wheel that lies at the center of the Outlands. As he explores the city, asking questions and seeking Farad, he comes across numerous strange characters, creatures, and villains, recruits allies to help him, and through the course of his action shapes a new identity and moral alignment. After passing through many dangers, he finds Farad serving as the chief of an underground village of scavengers. Farad agrees to provide the Nameless One with the information he seeks, but at a price. First, he must delve into the depths of the Weeping Stone Catacombs and retrieve a sensory stone called the Bronze Sphere. Reluctantly, the Nameless One agrees, and after passing through the Dead Nations and the Cranium Rat Collective, he finds his own tomb, where he reads further messages left behind by his former self. This, unfortunately, only serves to create more questions than it answers. Returning to Farad, the old scavenger finally provides the promised information, helping the Nameless One to piece together a few hints regarding his past. He then introduces the party to his adoptive daughter, Anna, who was the one who discovered the Nameless One's body and sold it to the dustman of the mortuary. She agrees to take him to the place where she found him. As they leave, a group of shades appears, surrounding Farad and killing him. And that is the point we will be covering in today's episode. Max, thank you for returning again to be with us for our Planescape analysis. We appreciate you. Thanks for having me again. Um, there is so much that can be covered uh, yes. in that small <laughs> amount that was there in the opening of the episode. Yep. Um, and I, I want to reiterate, this is something we have talked about in the prior episodes to this, but th this is not a podcast where we're going to exhaustively talk about everything and cover all the lore and all that. All 800,000 words. It's not happening. Yeah. No, it's not happening. <laughs> not happening. This is about getting at the core of what the game's message is, its, it's thematic intent, and uh, what it's trying to say. So, there may be some things that you, the audience, who are watching, were like, hey, what about this? Feel free to leave that in the comments and say, I think that this relates to uh, this topic in this way, can maybe you talk about that mm -hmm. in the future? And we will definitely look at that and consider it. But just know the purpose of this uh, podcast is not to exhaustively cover every single conversation and every piece of lore and every faction that doesn't even appear in the game. And there's all a bunch of there's like 15 of them, yeah, exactly. So you wake up and Mort approaches you, and he's funny, right? And he's funny, you, yeah, you've yeah. got he's like. Checking out the, the zombie ladies and stuff. Jeez, right? That's so that's so embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like they kind of set that tone we were talking about really yeah. early on, right? But it's it's Dahl who's kind of in the next adjacent room from where you wake up that you really start getting your first piece yeah. of uh, the puzzle as far as to like putting together the nameless ones like prior lives and stuff. 
He's got that huge book that he's just like. I love that. It's really cool. Writing in, I love it. This old scribe with this like giant book that he's writing stuff down in. So you know, he seems to know you. So he asks, um, you know, the nameless one, I should say, asks, "Do you know me? Know you? I have never known you, Restless One. No more than you have known yourself." Yeah. As always, the question, because the nameless one responds to that, like, wait, who are you? I love this line. I just think it's clever. As always, the question and the wrong question as always. There you go. (laughs) I thought that was... I thought that was a really great line. It shows the cleverness, the wittiness, I think, of yeah. Avalon's like writing. I, 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 I'm guessing he wrote this. Of course, there were others who wrote different mm-hmm. sections, so maybe not. But um, there's there's so many lines of dialogue that just they're they're very clever or witty in that way, and and it's filled with that. Not even just in the dialogue, but in the descriptions of the way the characters are saying it. Um, yeah. Like it's, like we said in I think episode zero, like. You can almost look at this more like a visual novel type of experience. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because there's yeah. descriptions of like the way people look and emote yeah. in between dialogue. It, it's a lot like reading a novel. Yeah. Um, so, it. I just thought that that line was was really good, and it really sets up a big mystery. Now, it does. Because now you're like, wait a minute, like it's like he kind of knows me, <laughs> but he doesn't really, and but we don't know ourselves, but he yeah. doesn't know us either necessarily, right? Yeah. Per se. Um, and he's also got that line. I mean, he's he's our introduction to the Dustman kind of philosophy, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Which is more or less life is death and death is life. Yeah. Like, he, just kind of flip those two. Yeah. Um, well, I want to get into that a little bit with the whole Dustman stuff because it, mm. it, it fascinated me like immediately too. Um, it, it's crazy how like almost the first like real conversation outside of like Mort. Mm just when you first wake up, it's already delving into yes. sort of deep philosophy, yeah. like right away. And I thought that this was the philosophy of the game. I was like, all right, they're getting us primed and this is what we're going to be doing. This is how yeah. it's going to be. And I didn't, I didn't realize there were different factions throughout yeah. the game and that you're going to be exploring all kinds of philosophies. But the fact that they chose this one first yeah. is very interesting. I, I, I think so too. Yeah. And, and it plays well, into kind of trying to, like we said before, do the opposite of what you expect. So the game mm. starting with death, yes, exactly, and that sort of thing, yeah, and yeah. so it just They're kind of naturally you. flows. Yep. Yeah, They're saying what the way you've been thinking up to this point, we're flipping it. Yeah, we're doing the opposite, and here's some really big examples. Yeah, like for instance, um, he comes in, he's dead, he starts out dead, and then comes from the light right mm-hmm. to the darkness. Yes, that's and true. And then he wakes back up. It's like <laughs> anyway, it, it, this is a whole backwards kind of yeah. situation here, and then we're learning from people. Oh, the you know the true death. Right. is life and right. the true life is death yep and everything's being flipped on its head yeah in the course of this conversation doll brings up two kind of terms the shadow of life and the true yeah, death I, I got that one yeah. so he says yes a shadow you see restless one this life it is not real your life my life they are shadows flickerings of what life was or once was this life is where we end up after we die and here we remain trapped, caged, until we can achieve the true death. True death is non-existence, a state devoid of reason, of sensation, of passion, a state of purity. And again, it's really interesting to go back and read some of the stuff or listen to it again um, after having completed the yeah. game and yeah. like seeing some of the conclusions because this is so opposite of like the sensates. Oh my gosh! Yes. <laughs> like literally the total yeah. opposite of the sensates yeah. mm-hmm. um, philosophy, and we'll talk more about the sensates in the episode where they actually come up, which will be next week. Next um, but yeah, I mean, like it, it, to, to start your game off with sort of that kind of what I, what I think most people would consider dire sort of outlook, yes, is interesting. And I think I think that was intentional. I think they just wanted to make sure people understood what they were getting into. Yeah, like right. all <laughs> you, you start out the game in the grossest place, and <laughs> the first person you talk to is just like very very pessimistic. And um, you know that's this game. Welcome to the game. This is what you're gonna be doing for the next you know fifty hours. Right. Um, go ahead. I think I think you're gonna say something there. Uh, y- yeah. Just one additional thing on top of that. Absolutely agree with that. It's a great way to hook people in with just the novelty of starting off with uh, talking about nihilism and um, 
existentialism in the most pessimistic way. That's, you know, if this were a JRPG, that'd be somewhere near the end where you're about to fight them and they're like, life is meaningless, but then you defeat them. And then, uh, you know, like embracing life and friendship and love and all that triumphs. No, it starts off right at the very beginning with that. But it also uh, further establishes its unique identity, I think, by the character of Mort, because he has a lot of really (laughs) interesting, colorful dialogue that sort of lowers the tension so it's not entirely serious all the time and really ropes you in that way. One line that I really like from him when he's describing the mortuary, I'll quote him directly. The mortuary has all the architectural charm of a pregnant spider. (laughs) <laughs> I like that line a lot. That was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have both of those and uh, yeah, you it's like, okay, this is what I'm in for. I dig it. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Mort is hilarious. Um, from the very beginning, it's very difficult to find Mort in a, a, a serious like situation where he's actually being appropriate to the, the weight of what's going on. Right. Um, he's mm-hmm. always trying to make a joke. And this kind of lends itself all throughout the game. You're 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 gonna kind of your your opinion on Mort is gonna you know shift and evolve. But he is what he is. He's a he's a dismembered head <laughs> <laughs> that floats with eyeballs still. Yeah. And why does he have eyeballs? I don't know. Um, but you know, like he is who he is. And when you talk about like you know the nature of what a thing is, like this is Mort. This is who he is. Mm-hmm. And, and there's there's really not much to do about it. <laughs> imagine imagine Vice from Near if he were an edgy high schooler. That's who Mort is. <laughs> oh my gosh, Mort is totally Vice. I, why didn't I think of that? That's a, that's that's a good point. Yeah, um, I think the the one thing that's really interesting about your first encounter with Mort as well, and this is also something I don't think you'd even think about until the second playthrough or something, mm. is his level of familiarity with you. In the yeah, way he talks. That's this right. is not somebody talking to you as if they're meeting you for the first time. Yes. He calls you chief as like the immediate, <laughs> <That's> like <right. laughs> the immediate, like, hey, chief, like, how are you feeling or yeah, whatever? Yeah. And he, he's talking to you. And he, this is not something you would like, again, like directly notice, like right away on your very first encounter or first play through the game. Mm. But you go back and, and look at it again and like look at the way he's, you know, read the way he's speaking. And it's like, this dude totally knows who you are. Yes. <laughs> this has happened before. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that's a really nice touch. I also wanted to bring up that in the course of the conversation, um, Dahl gives some hints about Farad and and warns the Nameless One not to seek him out. So they're kind of putting uh. two sort of conflicting things together. I think this is another great way to, uh, to, to hook the player into the story. You, you wake up and you have tattoos on your back, a message to yourself. Like prison prison break. Yeah. Message mm. to yourself. Uh, yeah. Memento has this kind of thing oh, too, right? that's right. Because right. so, he that's doesn't right. want to forget what yeah. he's supposed to be doing. Um, telling you, like, go seek Farad and this journal. And then you go talk to Dahl in the next room. He's like, do not seek Farad. The bad idea. <laughs> or the journal. I love the whole journal thing, too. Yeah. It's hilarious. Because you're going around town and you're just like, hey, hey, has anyone seen a journal around? <laughs> it's such like, of course I haven't. We talk but everyone's about. like, no, I can't believe. Oh, you know, my second cousin's niece's nephew's <laughs> friend said that he saw a journal. <laughs> so maybe you should go to that place. And it's like, what? Does no one have a journal here? Is there one journal in this whole entire, in all well, of Sigil? it's also such a weird thing, like, to think about, uh, just like in real life, you lost your journal. And so <laughs> yeah. you, like, went into town. Have you seen a journal? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about, dude? Like, what, <laughs> like, what journal? <laughs> you go ask your neighbors, hey, have you guys seen a journal around? And, but everyone takes it seriously, dude. Well, That's especially almost especially because he doesn't have a memory. He couldn't describe what the journal no, looks not like. No, not at even. all. He's just a journal. Yeah, yeah. And he asks, well, you can because you choose. You ask yeah. everybody, have you seen a journal? Some a journal. nondescript <laughs> book like lying around here And somewhere. most people haven't. No. <laughs> That's the weirdest part. Of course part. not. <laughs> it's and, such a strange question to ask. Yeah, but he, he's it. got nothing else to go on. So right. like you know, do what you can, I guess. The worst right. thing that can happen, they say no. But <laughs> um, I want to talk about the dustmen here a little bit. So they believe in something called the true death and that passion is an obstacle to true enlightenment. Um, hmm. life, uh, life itself is an obstacle to removing passion. The trappings of life are meaningless and all should cleanse themselves of passion and ultimately life itself to achieve the nothingness of true death. 
They believe that passion is what anchors souls to what they deem a false life and force those to, uh, too passionate to be reborn again and again. One must divest themselves of it, of passion, to escape this cycle. So, he says, passions mm. carry weight as long as one clings to emotion. They will be continually reborn into this life, forever suffering, never knowing the purity of true death. To achieve true death, you must kill your passions and strip yourself of the need for sensation. When you achieve this, you achieve peace. Past the eternal boundary lies the peace we all seek. So it seems to me this that is like Buddhist monk. I was just going to bring that up. Um, this philosophy seems to have some real world inspiration yeah. in Buddhism, Stoicism, um, in in the uh, the works of Arthur Schopenhauer yes. a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, as well as a costumism. Um, mm. So I wanted to kind of pass this on to you guys because I have a lot to say on this. And mm. you'll know why if you've been watching our podcast for a while <laughs> and our continuing discussion on eternal life is actually damnation and hey, stuff. Hey, this will be fun. But, okay, <laughs> but I wanted to pass it to Max first yeah. to get some of your thoughts on uh, the True. Dustman philosophy. Well, okay. So you, uh, the two most prominent elements of this are Nirvana and Schopenhauer. Uh, Nirvana and Buddhism is the primary goal um, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to cease any striving that your ego has so that way you can turn inward and essentially dissolve it so that you become one with nothingness that's what nirvana is the thing that's sort of different uh about this conception of true death in planescape is that it's a lot more pessimistic than the way that the buddhists tend to approach it at least when it comes to the journey towards nirvana there's a sort of hope to it and it doesn't I can't, you know, the images of the happy Buddha and all that. It's it's not it's supposed to be this uh, arduous journey. And it's not like you're not supposed to view life as this terrible mistake. Uh, it's 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 all about the journey. Right. But Schopenhauer, he though he was inspired by Buddhism, he he viewed it in a much more pessimistic light. He, he saw that life was a true it was actually a mistake and this sort of goes back to his uh master work which is uh, what's it called the world is will and representation he saw that all of existence was essentially uh it was expanded upon by this one underlying metaphysic which he just called the will and the will is sort of this blind thing that sort of goes outward into the cosmos and doesn't have any uh feeling it doesn't think for itself you know it's there's no god that's behind it it's completely indifferent to you as a human and uh because of that he well that's why he was pessimistic about it so schopenhauer's view on the will uh as it, it relates to the way that the universe has unfolded is that it's sort of this mindless aimless non-rational devoid of intellect beyond any descriptions of good and evil but most importantly it's devoid of any meaning and because of that Schopenhauer sort of despaired at that notion. Uh, the fact that existence, particularly when it comes to consciousness, is completely unfeeling and people are just going to suffer no matter what. And because there's no meaning to any of it, then it would just be better for all of living to like, cease to exist, basically. And that's sort of what the dustmen are trying to aim at. So, in other words, um, yeah, uh, Schopenhauer kind of... Nietzsche kind of completes our Schopenhauer's arc, basically. Right, right. Like you've got to go through the Schopenhauer stage, but then you <laughs> got to come out on Nietzsche. the other end with Nietzsche. <laughs> you, Nietzsche mm. then takes the torch and says, "Okay, that was all you could do, Schopenhauer. Okay, I'll finish the journey this for you." The and then he shows people from, how yeah. exactly the will to power right. and beyond good and evil and the Ubermensch and like, like let's do this, man. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, Schopenhauer just kind of this is, gives up. They were good friends until this kind of disagreement <laughs> about will came up right yeah he, I, I did they i actually don't know if they knew each other technically oh oh really i thought that they no were. he uh yeah nietzsche was aware of schopenhauer's works so i don't think they ever interacted i don't think oh, they knew each other okay like that's interesting if if it has ever been put that way it's mostly like a metaphor of like oh they were friends until they broke up or whatever sure but i don't think nietzsche actually met schopenhauer um nietzsche just kind of took his mantle and carried it to a place that has, well, gosh, as far as he could take it, I guess. Sure, I don't know that anyone's yeah. taken it further than him even right, still. Right. Right. Um, 
I want to say kind of before I get too much into what I want to talk about mm. with this, um, this game, I think very purposefully takes these philosophies to a, a very, um, a very far extreme. No, yes. like to an extreme of almost being absurd. Yeah, which actually made it difficult to join any faction because yeah. all of them were so, even if there were some underlying points that I agreed with, it's yeah. like you are all such zealots about yeah. whatever thing you belong to. It is just like beyond the pale, right. like all of them. Right. And I, I think this is very intentionally done um, for a reason that if I don't like arrive at in today's episode, certainly we will by the end. Okay. Um, but I do think they, they very purposefully do this. Um, each faction, actually almost everything you encounter in the game, seems to be this over-the-top exaggeration mm. of it. Oh, Even the yes. concept yeah. of torment or suffering. Right. Like, everything you see is, like, as gross, as horrible, <laughs> as bad. <laughs> yes. The suffering is as much suffering yeah. as you can possibly conceive. Right. right. I think they take everything to as extreme as a means of like sort of presenting an abstraction sure kind yeah. of we talk about abstractions all the time particularly yeah, yeah. with the jrpg but usually kind of. not in this way though no it's usually but it's the same idea it is yeah you yeah. use an abstraction in order to present like a present something yeah. but without showing it how it actually is in the real world, but yeah. it gets across the idea. Yeah. And that's the important part right. in storytelling is not necessarily being exactly parallel or, or mirroring, ex mirroring exactly how the world is, mm. as much as it is communicating to the audience the concept that you're trying to show to them, yeah. right? So I think in the, in the pursuit of them trying to say what I what I at least took away from this game. They are purposefully going farther than yeah. things tend to go, or at least you only see this maybe on the fringes. Yeah, right? yeah. To illustrate a point. To right? illustrate a point. Yeah, yeah. And so it's and just a vehicle. <laughs> yes. It's it's they're just using it as an abstraction. They're not trying to say these um concepts that you find in Stoicism and Buddhism and Arthur Schopenhauer's work yeah. is this extreme. They're they're taking those things to their extreme right. to get across a larger point. Wh which is it's which just makes you not like any of them. <laughs> like, <laughs> like there's very little philosophy throughout this game I, that I, I actually that's what identify I'm getting with. At. I okay, think good. that's kind of what the, what they're getting at. Ah. Is the, and and it's in the name, Planescape Torment, right? And yeah. and we'll get into this a little bit when we get to Fell, who tells you that the tattoo on your shoulder is the symbol for torment. Uh, right. I I actually wonder if that's like the what do they call the day, the day balls the whatever the the, the oh the dabu the da dabu dabu whatever so. they're called the the little mm -hmm. guys that go around like fixing sigil. Oh, they yeah. work for the Lady of Pain and they. Yeah. Uh, they have the little symbols that appear above their head when they talk. That's right. right? That's right. That's I think right. it might be their symbol mm. for the concept or word torment. Ah, very I'm, nice. I don't know that for a certainty. That, that just occurred to me. Maybe that's what that means. Hmm. So we got a tattoo of that. And, and Fell's the one who does the tattoos on all your tattoos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what I think that is. Hmm. Anyway, torment as like a, a very central sort of concept they're exploring here, right? Again, exaggerated beyond what most people's lives would actually entail as far as the amount of suffering mm -hmm. that in order to make sense of that in order to find a purpose in that torment people turn to these kinds of ideologies sure as a means of coping with torment with suffering mm -hmm. right how can yeah. i make this suffering which I don't have a lot of control over, everyone who goes through life yeah. is going to experience some level of suffering. It's kind of what life is to a certain... Of course, it's not just that. It's also the other side of the coin, which is what I'm going to get around to later as well. But how do I cope with this? How do I make this mean something? Mm -hmm. And that's where all of these ideologies, religions come from, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like moral codes or whatever. Right. It's all a way for people to cope with their suffering, with their torment, right? Right. And so I think they're trying to really point out, like, it, it. all of these things exist so that the people who are in this 
horrible suffering here in this world can find some way in which that they can find a purpose in it. And so you're not supposed to look at any one of these and go like, that's the right one. <laughs> right? right. Okay. Because that's the, the point. point, the larger yeah. point is it doesn't matter. There, there isn't really a right one. Mm. You're just supposed that people just use this to try to make sense of right. their own suffering and torment. That's that's what I think they're getting at with that, or why they went as far as they did in the abstraction. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. That, that I think you're probably right about that. So, yeah, I I say all this to preface what I'm about to talk about as far as what I agree with in these <laughs> <laughs> philosophies and what I don't. Yeah, by saying none of these, none of these are ones, like yeah. appealing philosophies, or to any degree would I be like. But I kind of do that in real life, anyways. Like. To, there, I, I, I don't really uh, go to one mode of thought and be like, oh, I, I wholeheartedly believe in this ideology. Right. I, I, I'm kind of a person who's like, I like this piece of this or this piece of this, but this and this doesn't jive with me, doesn't make sense, doesn't right. pass my vibe check, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know, so... And, and I think that's kind of what you're supposed to do yeah. with exploring these factions, too. You're supposed to think about them more. They're, they're, okay, what do I really feel about life and death and suffering? Right. And, you know, you're supposed to start thinking about those concepts, not align yourself with one necessarily, <laughs> right? <laughs> At least that's what I think. I think that's probably true. Um, in order to... Um, oh, geez. In order to um, make a value judgment, you kind of have to... There's no view from nowhere, right? Like, yeah. um, if you're going to say something's good or bad, you you have to be somewhere. That You have to have a point of view. Um, and you have to have something that you're standing on from which you are, you know, making these pronouncements. Um, so, to the extent that it might be appealing to just do none of them, yeah. um, at the same time, and then just use your your lone isolated self as the guide of whatever you want, right? Um, it helps to have an idea of something before you start looking around at other things. In fact, that sentence, looking around at other things, suggests that you are somewhere to begin with. Yeah, right? you have a foundation you're standing on in the beginning to, yeah, yeah, yeah. from which you can actually start. To Otherwise, none with. of this makes any sense, right? Yeah. So the relativist argument um, works except to say that you have to be somewhere. Whereas in this game, you don't really have to be anywhere, so you can just kind of poke and prod and like, yeah. hey, you guys are stupid for this, you guys are stupid for this, and I'm over here and I'm just, I'm just, I'm right, you know? Um, whereas uh, the truth is you are somewhere already through culture or for whatever reasons. Um, and then from that perspective, you are now looking out at everything else. So, so right. the way I would normally see it is that these types of philosophies, were it to be all encompassing, would kind of encompass everything. Everybody would fit into one of these. Yeah. But these philosophies in this game, no one I know fits into any of them. Yeah. yeah <laughs> like any exactly. of them at all. Right. Um, and so that's where it gets kind of funny. So instead of these big circles, almost like the planescape itself, right? These big infinite, you know, universes, um, you have you have uh, small, little, very restrictive kind of circles and just a few of them and then a ton of empty space yeah. within which you can kind of, you know, experiment and explore. Sure. Um, and so that's maybe like a difference. But that that helps in order to take something that is so big and you kind of shrink it down to a small thing that's easy to kind of contain. And in order to do that, you have to kind of exaggerate and you yeah, have to really sure. show the extreme and the fringe and all of that stuff. Yeah. But what the, the downside to that is that you end up with a ton of empty space Whereas in my opinion, there is no empty space. Yeah. That you're, there is nobody who has zero, like is a blank slate. And sorry, uh, you're good. there's nobody who is a complete blank slate in terms of uh, morality. Yeah. I, I Two things I want to respond to on that. First of all, I think that for basically everybody, um, that foundation is sort of naturally given through yeah. whatever it is that your parents yeah. believe, right? Right. So sure. you're kind of just Wherever like you adopted born, into that and that's yeah, your totally. starting point point on the ladder or whatever whereas with this um, guy the amnesia thing is yes, just like that I throws a huge wrench in it yeah. he literally has nothing to stand on right right he's a total blank slate and now thinking about that yeah that would make it even like at least me Ooh. playing the game I, in real life i have a memory and i have uh you know a, a, a philosophy that i grew up with as yeah. far as like 
the culture I lived in, the family I lived in, that yeah. s gave me a set of values yeah, yeah. upon which to then judge what the Other dustmen things. are saying. Yeah. But he has none of that. He doesn't, yeah. yeah. yeah but the game like, developers did. Yes, that's true. And that's why there is something of a, a, what is called in politics an Overton window. There is something of a, like, a, a space within which all of where, where within which all of these ideas are presented. Yeah. Right. And they're the ones that are kind of filling in the gaps for for you essentially, right? Because yeah. you can't do anything in the game. You can only do what they allow you to do, what the sure. developers kind of allow you to do. Sure. Which is quite a bit. It's a lot. Yeah. And their Overton window is quite wide <laughs> in sure. this game. You can do all kinds of <laughs> all sorts of things. Um but um generally speaking, despite the fact that Nameless One should have this blank slate uh, as soon as Mort talks to you, as soon as you walk around, yeah, as soon true. as things start happening, um, you slowly start to get a pretty restrictive um, boundary kind of around what is right or wrong or what should or shouldn't happen. Yeah. I don't think it takes that long. Yeah. Um, I want to pass this over to Max for a second if you have anything to add to that before I go into yeah, my feelings. Just a, just a couple things in regards to the whole uh, extreme ex abstractions. I think it helps from a storytelling point of view just to be able to present these things uh, in that way just so you can get a quicker idea of how uh, these people act, but also just to get closer to the root of what these philosophies are all about. Because, you know, if you presented all of them as like one big expansive textbook, people are just going to lose interest very quickly and you sort of take away the gamified element. Although, now, whether although or not, this sorry? game is one massive textbook. <laughs> that, that, that <laughs> well, I know that's uh, that's the ironic thing. Like, but like it still manages to maintain that while also still being somewhat fun. But yeah, you know what I'm saying. But moving. Uh, but the great thing, though, about the present presentation of these extreme abstractions, whether you're playing the game or playing the tabletop, is that it's a great way of being able to view a whole bunch of different philosophies at once contend with them, figure out what's the good, what's the bad. And then part of the, like one of the most fun things, at least for me when I was playing, and I'm sure for a lot of other people playing Planescape Torment is to say, okay, if I were to choose one of these 15, which one do I feel at home with the most? And then once you have sort of contended with all of them and you sort of have a better idea of what your personal philosophy is, which is uh, Planescape is sort of a great tool in that regard. You can ask yourself, okay, do I have the courage to create my own meaning going back to Nietzsche and maybe set up my own uh, uh, personal philosophy that other people might adhere to. Yeah, sure. Great point. That's very good, actually. Um, um, but yeah. real quick, because I ended up in um, the Sensates when I played yeah, the game. Right. Which is literally the total opposite of the Dustman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 100%. Um, but, well, I guess we'll talk about them later. Yeah. But... Um, I wouldn't. That's not me. <laughs> like yeah, I personally, you wouldn't right. have chosen Don't the sensates in real life. Yeah, but in a game, you got to do everything, man. You got to yeah, try everything. Try you got to go out. and have all the experiences yeah. the game has to offer. Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, so, just wanted to say shout out to Case and I also did the same thing. So oh, nice. Okay, nice. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, in regards to what the the dustmen believe about death. I've said very similar things in the past on the podcast that I that I feel like mm -hmm. like true eternal life would at some point and that point would be different for every person <laughs> yeah. would start to become a burden and I think this is something that it I don't I'm not like alone in like we, yeah. I I think probably a lot of my feelings on that were shaped by some of the media I grew up with yeah. uh, this game itself kind mm -hmm. of like has that although the eternal life in this game is not really like what p most people would choose if they had a chance to have <laughs> eternal life when you die and forget <laughs> most people because that's really just death is yes, like yes. forgetting who you were and becoming a whole new person yeah, but a big um uh, lord of the rings has has sort of this motif where like there's just sort of a fatigue a, a tiredness that comes over the elves they just like weary right. of, of life and of the world and they want to fade and kind of go into the west sure. um so th there's something that i guess i've always found intuitive about the idea that living forever would not necessarily be this boon or blessing that people yeah. think it would be that at some point like this life becomes a burden so i do really feel that way that that's something i believe um and that kind of aspect that they pulled i think from some of the sources like we're talking about uh that make up what the dustmen think mm -hmm. there is this other side of it and i think that max touched on this earlier really well 
where like Buddhists don't live this like um this life of like oh this life sucks and I, <laughs> I can't know, wait I, to I, die. this is all <laughs> false and I shouldn't be here and it's all you know I can't wait to like get out of this that they still yeah. live very fulfilled lives right and that's you know some of the nuance there that all of these very extreme uh, philosophies we encounter in the game don't have right um, right so I, I feel yeah. like there's little elements here that like I, I was very intrigued by and that I agreed with but mm. the way they live is something I totally disagree with <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think they they poke the holes in this way of thinking really really well almost as soon as you get out of the mortuary yeah. and you go into the, what is it, the the, the bar, the, the tavern, yeah, the, dust, place. the gathering dust bar. Mm. There are several of the dustmen in here that you can tell are struggling with actually believing these things. I think that in, in a way, it is against the nature of a man to believe the things that the dustmen claim to believe. Hmm. And and that and they're fighting against their own nature. They're fighting right. against the nature this. of a man yeah. to try to accept that no true death is better than life, which goes against every instinct that every animal yes. has. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> billions of years. With. Yeah, yeah. So th with that with that lens on, as I'm going back through some of this dialogue, I find it really really fascinating. Like you're you're talking to um, Mortai Gravesend who wants you to sign a contract. This, this is the thing that Dustman do. They go sign That's contracts right. with people, which basically allows them to take your body and turn After it into a, a zombie slave labor yeah. worker yeah. for them. Um, and they'll pay you a little bit of money to do that. So there, there's one guy, I think his name is uh, Ang Angyar, who regrets having signed this contract. Yeah, yeah. And you can do a little quest to like have that I contract that one, yeah. terminated. Um but he, he, you, you notice how more Tai is a little too eager to get you to sign this document. It kind of goes against the tenets. You're a little too passionate mm -hmm. about your, how, how excited you are to try to get me to sign this thing. Uh -huh. And, and he, he gets <laughs> mad and then he realizes, oh, I'm not supposed to be mad. I'm supposed to be just this passionate, like, <laughs> That's right. person, like, oh. And, and it's showing that a lot of what they believe is so clearly against the the big question of the game, yeah. the nature of a man. Right. And and they actually bring that up so early, I had forgotten mm -hmm. how early that question yeah. actually comes up. Um, at least for me, the first time I saw that was speaking to, who was it in here? I think it's Emmerich, who is the, oh no, it's not Emmerich. It's any, it's any of these dustmen who you sign a contract with because as you're signing it, there there's basically like a, a set of jumbled memories that sort of jump back into uh, the nameless one's mind as he's oh, trying to sign. It's right. like something's wrong with this contract. I can't sign my name for some reason. Yeah, and he's like trying and trying, and then he looks up and like the the dustman's face has been replaced with a skull. Uh. And um, he said the skull says sign, but remember everything has its price, and what can change the nature of a man. Like right from mm. there, and there's actually numerous mentions of this question far before you get to, like the actual famous place in which this question is asked hmm. in the in the later stage of the game. Oh, very. So they're kind of like setting that up, like all the way from the beginning. Hmm. But I thought it was interesting that they kind of show through each of these people, whether it's Mortai, whether it's um, Seer the skeptic, the the woman who was like a, she was like a teacher. Uh, among the dustmen taught this philosophy her whole life and then she got sick and was on her That's deathbed right. and yep. then actually encountered her own mortality mm. and now she's having a crisis of faith right right she says the dustmen aren't afraid because they've been swallowed up so much they've been swallowing so much of their own bat droppings over the decades they've blinded themselves into thinking that death is some kind of release there's something about having your faction members circle around your uh, deathbed like a pack of pale-faced ghouls nodding and agreeing that your suffering and dying is all for the best. Oh, Seer is so fortunate. She shall soon be relieved of the burden of life. Burden of life? That's when it struck me. There's something addled about not appreciating your life. Yeah. The dustman keeps saying that this life is all misery and suffering. Is it? 
And that question mm. that she's able to ask in a world like this, where suffering is so exaggerated, yeah, right? It's horrific. How much easier is it for us to say, is our life really all suffering? I think especially yeah. when you're going, really going through it, right? Yeah. It totally. can really feel that way. Yeah. And here it's almost actually true. Mm -hmm. And yet There's she can still, ask that question. Yeah. Is it really all suffering, right? That we should be happy to pass on into oblivion? You know, should we? And then you also talk to this other character awaiting death there. He's the younger member who's mm -hmm. trying to get you to sign a contract. And he you can be mm -hmm. you can basically test him. Like, well, if you uh, hate life so much, like, why haven't you killed yourself yet? And he's like, well, I've been <laughs> right. thinking of a means. Uh, will you do it? It's like, I'm not going to freaking kill you. You don't have the conviction to kill yourself. <laughs> right. Like, right. And he's like, I, and you can say something about, you know, I've died a lot of times. Like, That's not possible. You only die once and you can kill yourself. That's and right. I did that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like prove it to him and whatever. And he, he's just totally shaken by that. Right. Right. So I, I really liked not only that they kind of immediately confront you with this crazy philosophy mm -hmm. and give you all the perspective of doll, but then they show you this is actually unintuitive. This is actually against the nature of people. And a lot right. of people, even those who were in it their whole life, like Seer, they actually encounter their mortality and they start questioning it right, right away. So, you know, and then these, these places, mortuary and the, and the gathering dust bar, are like literally like right next to each other. It's like across <laughs> the street. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so they give you the philosophy, poke holes in it, like right away. Yeah. And that sort of sets the stage for, I think, what this game is I, getting at. That, they do that all the time. Every new philosophy you learn about, within the next 10 or 15 minutes, you learn a counterpoint to it yeah. again, like very quickly, very shortly after. Um, and anytime somebody's like, oh, here's a cool thing, and then it's like, boom, nope, that's not right. This is wrong, and this is why. And, oh, here's another one. Nope, nope, that's not it either. Mm -hmm. It's that's great. very interesting. I, I really, really liked how they did that. Yeah, me too. Um, Max, anything you want to add to that before we move on to the next part? No, not really. Just I think it's worth uh, repeating what we said at the beginning, that this is how they're choosing to start the game and just the boldness of that and how it sort of sets the stage for what the game's all about, the tone. And, uh, like, I mean, if you're going to this extreme right now, how is it going to really subvert expectations going forward? But somehow it manages to do so, and that's what makes it so great. Yeah, that's yeah totally. Gosh, the the um, autopsy girl with like the fingers. That's like oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. The, in, in the mortuary. Yeah, Are you kidding me. Um, she's uh, like she's it. like part. Uh, what do you call that? What do they call those people? They're like half demon. Half. Oh, I I put that down. A tiefling. Tiefling. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and she's got like ah. scissor fingers, basically, yeah. like just. Uh, their ancestors shared knickers with a demon. <laughs> I, like, I like that line. That's a great line. <laughs> That's a, from Mort. The fun little ne Nephilim kind of yeah, reference. Yeah, I there. think I think Mort's a perfect character because the world, yeah. like you've you've been saying this whole series so far, is so yeah. bleak and gross. Yeah, it is. And Mort is like a perfect comic relief. Totally for to lighten tension in this so world, so that it's which not you get just horrific, so yeah. dark and dreary. I mean, it almost is too much. Yeah. But again, they were pushing that on purpose. But then Mort's humor is also almost too much. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so you find a weird balance. A weird balance between <laughs> extremes that take things too far. Yes, exactly. But I, I think he's great. Yeah, me um, too. My next note, I want to get to yours if you have some before this, no, is, is Mourns for Trees um, and, and how belief is everything in this world. I, I really Let's wanted to touch on that. So there's this character, Mourns for Trees, who tells us about the nature of belief and how it operates in this world. Yep. He says, you're new here. I can see that now. You don't understand how things work in Sigil. Belief is everything here. Everything. Mm -hmm. um, excellent, my friend. Excellent. Thank you. After you agree to you know, help him out. He's trying to grow trees. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, right. that's like what he's trying to do. But he's like, I don't think anybody uh, you know, can really... And he's, he's talking about it in a way where it's it's... You, like that's not how trees grow trees grow by cultivating watering them putting yeah, them in yeah. good soil making sure they get enough sunlight right and he's talking about it like they're the people don't want or or care or believe enough in this vision i have of trees yeah, growing yeah. again in the in the in the hive and i think 
you can actually, as a dialogue option, bring that up to him and be like, what are you talking about? Just make sure it gets enough water and sunlight. <laughs> and then that's when he brings up, oh, I can see you're new here, right? Like, you don't understand how things work. So yeah. when you agree to help him, excellent friend, excellent, I thank you. You've given me back my confidence and my purpose. My purpose. That, that part really struck me. Yeah. Again, everybody here in this place of almost endless suffering is looking for a purpose and a reason yes, very much to so. justify that suffering, right? Yeah, um, Nietzsche said that, uh, what, if um, if someone has a why, they can bear any how? Yes, it? or yeah. any, yeah. Any what? Like that. Well, you can undergo tremendous suffering um, as long as there's a reason for it. Yes. And you can, you can really, uh, humans can do lots of amazing things as, as long as there's a point, if yeah. there's a purpose to it. If there isn't, we give up very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> If, if there's a reason that's strong enough, motivating yeah. enough for you personally, you'll bear almost any yeah. thing. And that's, um oh, what was the man's search for meaning? meaning? Yeah. That Frankel. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Frankel. Um, so in that book, he talks about how everybody could tell when somebody was about to die. Yeah. And it was because those people would, would start smoking the cigarettes that they were given as like a little ration. Everyone was given like two cigarettes and you use those to bargain for things. You trade them with people, the guards, you can give them a cigarette and they'll give you some extra food or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but when somebody just took it out and just decided to smoke that cigarette, it meant that it meant that they had given up basically. And once you give up hope, once you stop believing that you're going to have a good life in the future, yeah. those people died very quickly. Yeah. They didn't last long after that. Yeah. But the people who had meaning, and that's funny, that's what the book is called, Man's Search for Meaning, right? Um, the people who had meaning were the ones who survived and were yeah. the ones who were able to make it out yeah. because it was so bleak. You need, it, you need something to look forward to in order for there to be anything, yeah. really. We were talking about this on the way over here. This actually bleeds into some of the um, analysis we're going to do of Dune yeah. for Patreon. There's a connection here. Um, if you want to see that, join Patreon, link in the description. Um, but, you know, again, I feel like this is an abstraction, right? Yeah. They're not trying to say that if you just sit there and, like, believe hard enough, like, a tree's going to start growing. Like Care Bears? <laughs> like, uh, like, that works yeah. in this world, right? But that's, sure. again, it's an abstraction. It's illustrating a yeah. deeper point. A deeper truth. Which, which is, true. is yeah. that belief moves people. Oh, yeah. In a way that makes it probably the most powerful force yeah. in the world and that this it's so powerful that this is exactly what rulers and kings and uh religious leaders and whatever use sure. to move and manipulate people right if if you can take advantage of their belief it is so strong that they will be willing to do and overcome yeah. obstacles that seem impossible totally right and, and as long as you still have hope, which is a form of belief, right? Yeah, oh, it is. It's, yeah, belief it, in the future. I, I believe I will make it through this. Uh -huh. I believe that, and I want that so badly that I will go through whatever I have yeah. to and come out on that other side. People are able to do incredible, incredible yeah. things. It's basically everything that was done that is great that was done uh, by humans was done through that. Yeah. Right? And... <clears throat> some people who, as you mentioned it, it, it can easily lead people to be um, doing things that, you know, we would judge, we would deem to be not good. Um, and some people's solution for that is to get rid of belief, right? Yeah. And nothing happens. <laughs> nothing happens without belief. Yeah. Unless people believe, unless people can envision themselves in the future with something new or different, um, they won't make it. They won't do it, Right. Um, and so getting rid of belief isn't quite the answer. Now there is a problem. Belief can be taken advantage of, but it's also the only thing that motivates humans to do anything ever. Yes. And so you can't, you can't get rid of belief, nor, nor should you want to. Yeah. So what is it that you believe? Yeah. Well, that's what all these factions exist for yeah. in Sigil, because the Lady of Pain, this supernatural being of like, absolute neutrality mm -hmm. is not going to take up rule of right. this place. That's right, yeah. But somebody has to step in and try to create some level of order here. So while she sits back 
and just sort of like dispassionately like watches what goes on here mm-hmm. and from time to time will Intervene. maze people or yeah, punish yeah, them. <laughs> yeah. um, ultimately, she's not really ruling the like the day to day sort yeah. of like comings and goings of people or like it, really interfering with it at all. So these factions were started yeah. as a means of sort of imposing some level of order in this place. I think the Lady of Pain is happy as long as the factions stay separate. But as long as somebody does begin to unite things and as long as... If somebody does start to rise to the top of Sigil, um, I think she... Yeah, that's when she's, chops she steps down. in for sure. Yeah. And that's uh, the whole... So it just kind of can't it, happen. Auscar, Al- 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 um, the, the god of portals that oh. uh, you meet that one guy who's like the one believer. It's in the ornate box quest. Oh, yeah. So you yes. get to the end of that. I can't he, remember the he's name. He's the only one who knows how to open that yeah, safely. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and he's like the one believer left yeah. of, of Auscar or whatever the name of that god is who tried to sort of... He, he had a really big following, right? A lot of believers, which is what was giving him his oh, power. Sure. Yeah, they lend right? their power to him. That is and, how this works. And yeah. so she ends up mazing him yeah. and anybody who follows him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so at that point, there's only one person left who believes in this God. So I remember there's that. no power left. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Right? And yeah, I, I think yeah. you can actually, in that conversation with him, you can become a follower of Oscar oh, right. and you'll get mazed. Oh, by really? the Lady of Pain. <laughs> I did. I know never that. have been mazed in this game. I've always avoided I, it. I did. I think, I think once I did. You, you so you got mazed. What yeah. happens? Because I've never done it before. Oh, you get put in a place. Oh gosh, I'm trying to think about this now. This was a few weeks ago, but you get put into a maze, right? And you have to find your way out. <laughs> <laughs> That's I it? mean, yeah, um, it's it's difficult. There are enemies in certain parts, and you can only see because they do that shroud thing, like that. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the whole game does it, I guess. But like the command and conquer, like yeah. you can see sort of what you've been, where you've been before, but everything else is just black. Yeah, and doing a maze like that sucks. <laughs> um, but but there is a way to eventually, you know, yeah. find a portal. There, I think in in the mazes there are several portals, but they don't always lead you back to where you want to be mm. um sometimes you go through a portal and it's another maze right and yeah. it's just like ah and that's part of the frustrating thing about it but if you go through the right portal then you can um get out of it i think this is a pretty natural lead into ingress the whole like ingress's yes. teeth quest yes yeah, which yeah. i thought was pretty which, cool the word ingress it's greek and it means portal it means like an entryway or or something like that yeah it's what the word means so she, the fact that she's having trouble with you know finding the right portal yeah, to get back and to the right her. key yeah, and can playing. you imagine that? How long? Thirty years or something yes. like that of just like being stuck, and she's afraid to go through a single doorway. Yeah, through for thirty Cause, years. Because, oh, well, man. what was it? I Anything forgot. She could lost. Be a key. She lost. Did she lose a hand or oh, something like I that? Can't remember. Like she went through a portal and like her hand got like cut was off her hand or the key like or that. something? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. what. Yeah. Oof. That's that's right. That's what Crazy. it was. So she that that was so traumatizing yeah. that like she couldn't like bring herself to even test a single other door yes. in 30 years. She's just been stuck here, oh, even though she's wanting to get by. So it, it drove yeah. her totally crazy. And so anyways, you end up getting these teeth, which I guess are the right key for her to that's go back right, to the world right. she wants to go to. Um, oh my gosh. But yeah, like th- there's lots of those kind of little things. I, I want to mention that because we're not going to go over all these side yeah, quests. we just can't. But they, they do so much. And this is what I think is my favorite aspect about very well-written RPGs is when they make their quests tell little stories like that Yeah, that help you either um, understand the world you're in better, so they bring in some element of lore or something about the world that's really fascinating, or they tell you something more about your character, who you yeah. are, um, right. or... They have a really, really good reward. There's some Mm. good reason to do it. But typically, feeling handcrafted, right, and telling uh, this really cool story, that's the type of side quest that I think is the best you can do as far as side quests. Not the, let's create five different quest types and litter our open world (laughs) map with a billion of these everywhere. Like a procedural, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And, and you just repeat the same sort of yeah. action over and over and over again, which kind of became how RPGs, at least open world RPGs, were mm-hmm. developed for a long time. Yeah. And, uh, well, with Dragon Dragon's Dogma just came out, as well as The Witcher 3 several yeah. years ago, I feel like RPGs are sort of trying to get back Moving to more like what Planescape was, more like what 
these CRPGs were like back in the late nineties where this is the way that they wrote quests primarily. And yeah. they were always fascinating. They're right? very meaningful. Yeah. Fallout and all of that. Um, anyway, so, okay. uh, my next note is about fell the Davis, right? Okay. Um, he was formerly a, a servant of the Lady of Pain, like all the Davis are, right? He was cast out after becoming a priest of Ausgar. So I guess there are two. Oh, there you two go. people who believe in this <laughs> god left, right? Uh, the dead god of portals. As a possible consequence of this, he does not float as most other Davis do. Rather, he walks upon the ground on his feet. He sells That's tattoos right. in his parlor, keeping the nameless one's discarded skins in the back room to use as canvases for his tattoo art. <laughs> Again, just like the gross yeah. nature of this world. Because you walk back there and there's just these skins spread out and he just like practices his tattoo art on it. And it's your, your freaking skin. <laughs> so gross. <laughs> um, but no, all of your tattoos, I think, came from him. So yeah. um, there's kind of a couple of ways to actually approach this character, which I think is cool. Again, kind of going to a point I brought up in an earlier episode. There's more than one way to approach quests or to find solutions to things. Yeah. So they, they, they have this language you don't understand. Yeah, that's right. You, there are, is a way for you to remember it, to mm -hmm. like bring it out of your sort of latent memories from your past lives yeah. or whatever, because you did know it before. And then you can understand what the Davis say. Yeah. Or you can recruit Anna, who can translate for you. Or mm -hmm. you can recruit Dacon or Dacon, who can translate for you. Okay, and you yeah. can rely on what they tell you, which is not exactly the translation you would get had you oh, listened man. to it and understood it, which I think was really cool. Oh, it's very cool. It's very cool. But think <laughs> of in development, like selling that to the superiors being sure. like, hey, instead of using the same text file, <laughs> let's make new text and let's write slightly a different, different thing that's slightly different just because it'll be like kind of cool. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Really? <laughs> I could see the executives being like, just use the same file, man. I think Stop doing extra work. I think it's great. Um, yeah. But this is where he talks about torment, right? Um, so he can tell you about your tattoos, that the symbol on your left shoulder is the mark of torment. Kind of went over that already. Yeah. But he also can tell you about how your last incarnation died. So oh. basically, um, you were killed by shadows. Mm -hmm. And we see these at we the end of, of, of what we cover. Well, we see them a couple times. I think yeah. when you leave the mortuary, they sort of like oh, are yeah, looking that's around right. for you. yeah. yeah. And then uh, after you leave Farad's place and they all come circle him and kill him. Yep. So there they are these shadows kind of chasing you, which we'll learn more about later. Um, but those are what actually killed you in your last incarnation. Right. And then Anna found you and then uh, brought you sold to, you. sold you to the mortuary, yeah, yeah. to the dustman. Yeah, that's her job. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically all I wanted to bring up with Davis. Anything here that um, uh, cross with your notes, Max? Honestly, no. Just uh, I just think it's worth highlighting uh, what you were just saying before in the last conversation about belief. Uh, it's just that's something that everybody who's following along with us should really keep in mind. Just to what extent can belief help you transcend the perceived boundaries of existence? And what do we know for certain? Like what boundaries can be pushed, what can't be pushed? And do we even know uh, for certain whether those boundaries can or can't be pushed. Just something to keep in mind all the way up until the end of the game. That's all. You know, there, there was uh, something I was going to bring up earlier when we were talking about that that I decided against, but now that you say that, I'm going to do it. Um, imagine, you know, being a person 10,000 years ago. That's hard. And you just believed so much. There's a way for me to get to that moon in the sky. Oh, sure. There's a way it's for not me to that get far. there. There's yeah. a way to get there. Yeah. And everyone's like, you're an idiot. There's no way to freaking get to the moon. Yeah. Like, you're crazy. No. The boundaries that Max was just talking about, there is a way to get there. And it takes belief. <laughs> like, even, even if it means over the course of centuries, enough belief, enough trying, enough will. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Trial and error. Oh, sure. And, and scientific work. And eventually a rival who's also trying to do it at the same time uh, you're trying yeah. to race there. Sometimes that helps. <laughs> <laughs> right? But a belief yeah. enough, you the, the boundaries that we think exist will be broken at some point right. in the future. Yeah. And that takes belief. Belief is what shatters that. Right. Not uh, science or whatever. Science is the method through which your belief takes you through that boundary. Right. right. Um, but it's the belief that actually moves you through it. Right. 
Science so, is useless without belief. Exactly. They're, the science can do nothing unless belief happens first. Yeah. So thanks for bringing that up, Max. And here's what this episode mm-hmm. is going to be titled, by the way. This is my favorite line of the game up to this point. Mm-hmm. Die while you still can. <laughs> <laughs> but those dusties, man, they are... Um, they're We're gonna get so yeah. flagged. <laughs> ah, shoot! Should I should I put a little asterisk for the I? D asterisk E. <laughs> nah, no, no, no. Um. Okay. Outside, we also come across this barking wilder character. He's a chaos man. Um. I wanted to talk about this real quick. Okay. So there are a lot of factions in Sigil. In the game, there's only like I think five or six that five. you can act five that you can actually join. Um, and because mm. the Chaos oh, yeah. Men is one, I at least wanted to briefly touch on it. Um, I didn't join it in the game, but you you can join them. Okay, yeah. Um, and the way to do it is to be basically just as random and crazy as this guy is who's, like, <laughs> barking at you. <laughs> oh, those guys? Yeah, they're so funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, they basically believe that there's no order um, or pattern or even sense to the world. It's just pure chaos, and by embracing randomness... They have they become one with nature or with the multiverse, right? There's so, probably something to that. <laughs> yeah, this would be uh, if you're going to pair this with a philosopher. I would tentatively sort of say Albert Camus for this one. He's the absurdism mm. guy, yeah. uh, but he wasn't. I mean, he wasn't like that. <laughs> like <laughs> the, the, once again, this is absurdism taken to like a ridiculous degree, well, where it's like nothing matters. You may as well bark like a dog. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Whereas Camus was like, no, everything's absurd, but you still got to live, right? Have you heard of Discordianism? Ooh, it's I don't like think so. It's like an actual, so. more mm. recent philosophy. I'm oh, not going to go I'm over it. I'm not into it. recent philosophy. <laughs> I'm not going to go over it for sake of time, because okay. it's not really that worth talking well, about. Well, Discord, I but mean. it is freaking really, really weird. Yeah. And it's a real thing, and they have like a whole right. like Bible that they <laughs> Sick. have. It, 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 just look it up on Wikipedia or whatever and <laughs> like, give it a brush. You know, um, it's it's crazy. <laughs> Um, but I want to get into the smoldering corpse bar because this oh, is where good. there's, I think, the most substance of anything in the hive. Um, yeah. There, like, if you could easily walk into this place and spend well over an hour just yeah. talking to people in this one bar. There are very interesting people here it's from crazy. all over. Yeah. Um, so I, I took down just a few that I found interesting, um, partly because it, it's more factions that are you know joinable in the game. So there are three patrons that are mercy killers. So I wanted to talk about the mercy killers real quick. Um, they're also known as the Red Death, and there are people who are all about justice, right? True justice. They are the main uh, people for bringing justice to the streets of Sigil. Anyone who commits a crime goes onto their list and are hunt down. Uh, they're seemingly mm-hmm. righteous people, and they enforce justice according to the amount of injustice that had been previously served. They are a type of police force Hmm. with their armor serving as a type of uniform. Their methods are very extreme, but also extremely precise. They are joint in the single goal of stamping out all injustice from sigil. They firmly believe that by imposing justice on the multiverse, it can be cleansed of evil and made perfect. They dedicate their lives to dispensing justice, but it must be done correctly according to the law. Um, the meaning of the name Mercy Killer is said to be commonly misunderstood by foreigners as meaning that they will kill out of mercy, but it is almost the exact opposite. It is rather that they search to kill mercy itself. So instead of, well, I think people understand that just fine. <laughs> yeah. I don't need to explain that further. They take it upon themselves to punish the guilty of sigil at any cost and do not use mercy in any form in doing so. Uh, the factions seem to be indebted in some way to the Lady of Pain, having to do her bidding and helping her to keep order. There are people who are influenced largely by her presence. If some displeases her, or if something displeases her, mercy killers are sent after them. The mercy killers are upholders of the law and devote their lives to patrolling the streets of Sigil, although they tend to stay out of the poorer sections of the city, such as the lowly hive areas, though there are some here in this bar. The Mercy Killers work with the Harmonium and the Fraternity of Order to promote peace and stability in Sigil. The Godsman faction are on good terms with the Mercy Killers and are always looking for ways to get uh, into their good books. Their credo is that mercy is for the weak and the merciful should be punished. Uh, Appropriately, their headquarters is Sigil's prison. 
where they carry out the sentences of convicted criminals. So hmm. I'm sure that people can see some problems with such an extreme ideology right away. But Mer Mercy <laughs> is for the weak. <laughs> You guys right. make Batman look like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, another character who, this is, there's not really necessarily a particular philosophy to jump into with this, but it, it, it is possibly the most fascinating character in the game to me, mm. is O. Mm. Um, o. o claims to be a letter of the divine alphabet. Yes, yeah, very cool. Part of eternity, mathematical, organic, and metaphysical. He holds great disdain for mortals and their unthinking ways, but also sees potential of growth into truth. So when you talk to O, first thing that he says is, well met, Wanderer, you have forgotten again, haven't you? It's like, wait a second, do you know me? <laughs> He's like, as he opens his mouth, it says, this is what I was talking about, but the descriptions of how yeah. they say things, right? As he opens his mouth, you get that feeling of eternity again. Inside his mouth, you see no tongue, no teeth. It's almost as if this man were a shell surrounding an illimitable expanse. Illimitable, so without limits. Illimitable yeah. expanse. I have spoken with you before, and always you forget. Your endless quest to discover yourself ends always in your amnesia. You draw close to the truth and recoil. Let us hope that you have the strength to endure this existence. How do you know this? Like, mm. what the freak? You know this? How? <laughs> <laughs> it's always, every episode of our podcast has I have somewhere seen it. a Lord of the Rings <laughs> reference will appear. Can't count it. Uh, you, you can just, at some point, you can well, count I it. Well, I was about to do the, uh, even forgot our own name. <laughs> That's from Return of the King. <laughs> nice. Um, how do you know this? I know that you, like a fly, rise up from the wreckage of your old shell buzz about for a time, and curl up and die at the window of truth. That, that's, Ooh, that's so beautiful. I just have to hang on that for a second. <laughs> this is good writing. That man. is, this writing in this game yeah. is so good. It's very good. Like, you, that metaphor is just astoundingly profound when you, like, take yeah. a second to look, like, think about that. You bumble about the pain, seeing the light without any plan to your actions, and fall exhausted when you fail. You alight on others to feed from them for a time and move on with no regard to them. I have watched you come here and listen to your words and watched you move away no wiser. Will you learn from your mistakes, Seeker? Hmm. And he asks, who are you? Or you can ask, who are you? I am O. That's all he says. But the description is what's fascinating. Hmm. For some reason, when he speaks his name, it sounds like he's speaking of much more than a single letter as if the speaking of his name contained untold possibilities and nuances. No human tongue could ever create such a sound. Hmm. Then the question is, what are you? Right. It is my name. It is the name of a portion of eternity. I am a letter in the divine alphabet. Understanding me leads to understanding existence. I am writ in the true names of half of everything. My being encompasses truth. I am mathematic, organic, metaphysic. The divine alphabet is writ in the name of everything that exists, from the seed at the hearts of the eternal plains to the core of the great beyond. My brothers, sisters, and in parentheses, a single word translates into the two in your mind. And I kind of laughed at that because, like, the word siblings. Siblings, mean? I know. There's a, there's a way to do <laughs> That's this. That's not quite as profound as <laughs> maybe you thought. Um, and I reach across all that is, was, or ever shall be. We are thought and reality and concept and the unimaginable. And the first thing that would occur to somebody who ha has no idea who he is, well, you must know all the secrets of existence then. Mm -hmm. This is great. You can answer all, <laughs> all my me. questions. Because that's what it is, right? It's just verbal. <laughs> you, it can just be told to you, yep. right? I know many parts of them without a connection to my brothers and sisters. I am but a letter. Alone, I am a symbol. Combined, we are language and power. Right. So you don't know the secrets of existence then. I didn't say that. <laughs> a letter is still a powerful force, even on its own. Allow me to show you. And this, this part's brilliant. He opens his mouth wider and wider still. The mask of his face tears around his eyes, mouth, and nose, revealing that hint of eternity you glimpsed earlier. You are lost in it, adrift in it, a part of it. You return to your mundane sense and realize that O has vanished. Yet somehow your horizons have expanded. 
Enlightenment has brushed you, however briefly, across the brow. Hmm. And he ju- and the nameless one just says that was indescribable. So instead of words and the secrets of the universe, he got an experience that informs his being, right? Yeah. Without even really being able to explain it. Yeah. yeah. He got he got a taste yeah. of all the secrets of the universe. Yeah. And it was way too much to handle. And yeah. there's nothing he couldn't describe it if he tried. Right, exactly. Because he doesn't have all yeah. the letters of the divine, <laughs> the divine alphabet. alphabet. Now, this was really interesting because, okay, I should preface this first. <laughs> I am by no means in what I'm about to talk about um, endorsing or encouraging anyone to use any illegal substance <laughs> Oh, geez. <laughs> at all. I'm not telling you, you should do this. I'm not telling you anything like that. I'm just going to explain something that I think really relates to this in words that are some of the most powerful I've ever read. Oh, okay. Um, because I have had experience with psychedelic mushrooms. Right. I've talked about this a little bit in the past. Um, and I, f- for the longest time, I, I think most people who have had experiences with this would tell you, I can't really explain this to right. you. This is not something you can understand unless you've done it. Right. I, I, I can try, but it's, it's just... It, the failure is too immense to even like make the attempt worth it. Well, that's the joke, right? The joke about yeah. um, like a pothead or something is that they just like, or a hippie, sure. right? It's just like, you know, man, like they're trying to explain these things and it just sounds like nonsense. Yeah. And that's the joke of, of hippies. Yes. Uh, but it's true also at the same time. Like, yes. You can't explain it. And if you try, you're going to sound stupid. But should you risk sounding stupid in order to try? Yeah. And I I thought it was impossible. It probably still is impossible. But if anyone <laughs> came as close as you can yeah. to using the right words, it was this um, excerpt that I'm going to read from Sam Harris and his oh, okay. experience with psychedelics. Yeah. I'm going to read that. It's not the whole thing. It's just a, a part of it. Mm. But I, I feel like this really like... Um, crosses with this description of O in a way that just really struck me as being like, I was reading this part of O and I was like, that's exactly like what freaking Sam Harris was saying. So he says, now the first revelation is with respect to the absolute inefficiency of language to capture the experience. You are wading into a roiling ocean of meaning with the proverbial thimble. What you bring back in that thimble just can't begin to indicate the immensity of the experience or its beauty or its terror, depending. Even to oneself, as an aid to memory, language is next to useless. And the fact that there are landscapes of mind this vast, lurking on the other side of a mushroom, is simply preposterous. How could that make any sense? The scale of the thing is all wrong. It violates every uh, intuition you have about what it is to have a mind and a body in a world. Mm. It's as though we lived in a universe where if you reached into your right pocket with your left hand, rather than pull out your wallet, you pull out the Andromeda galaxy. So the experience is altogether too much. It's like a reductio ad absurdum Mm. of one's desire for experience itself. It's as though the cosmos were saying, oh, experience is what you want? You want to see and feel and think? Okay, how's this? That's uh, basically what just happened with O. Yeah. Oh, you want to know all the secrets of the universe? Let's see what you do here. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> okay, right. how's this? And then what follows is a vision so blinding in its beauty and intensity that it shatters your mind. It just unmakes you. Again, I have to admit the poverty of words here. We have a word for love, for instance. But what's the word for all of the love you could possibly feel? And all the love you recognize you have failed to feel at every moment in your life up until this moment. What do we call the experience of having that ocean of feeling invade you and fill every empty space in your mind? There really are no words to describe this experience, just as there's no way of snapping your fingers to describe it. Language is simply the wrong tool for the job. It sounds like um, his cup runneth over. <laughs> yes. Like he just can't, he can't receive what is being given. Like, I guess depending on 
how much you how much yeah. you've taken, like the dose yeah, yeah. and things like that. It might not be quite as deep as the ocean right. with a thimble, like he's sure, describing. Sure. Um, you know, but that that is kind of it. Just puts it, what the what those words put in perspective is the the struggling the, with the attempt to even try to help somebody understand what is beyond the boundaries of our yeah. sort of limited minds, the way that we experience reality in every day in comparison to, it's almost scary. Like the, like he said, um, the scope of, of experience of sensation of, <laughs> of, of meaning that, yeah. that can be found in this brain when you unlock it. <laughs> right. And that's kind of what I felt from O. It was like yeah. this this being that is so beyond even the gods right. of the planescape or, or D D mm. universe, right? Yeah. Something way beyond them. Right. That just sort of like came down into this dimension for a second. The monad, yeah. And it's just like, oh, he's come back again. Let's <laughs> give him a taste and oh, I see, yeah. he'll walk away no no wiser again. But you know, let's let's just see. If, hey, why not? <laughs> that's funny. Um yeah. I don't know if Sam Harris himself holds this, but I've I've heard. I I swear I've heard him say this, but I could be wrong about this. Mm. Um, that you you should not hold any idea, or you should not you should not believe anything that you cannot rationally defend. Something like that. That's that sounds like sort of that wave of new atheism. Yes, yeah. So if it's not from him, it's from one of the it's something like that. of that you know, one of the horsemen <laughs> that you should not believe something you cannot defend rationally, and then to hear him say that, which yeah. is words <laughs> fail yeah. horribly. Yeah, and then why are we limiting ourselves to belief? In things that can be rational. That sounds stupid. It sounds like now I'm sounding like a hippie, but whatever. Like, it sounds like, um, you know, the Enlightenment has got us all thinking a certain way, yeah. you know? Like John Locke and, and even Rousseau and Hobbes. And, like, we, we think a certain way based on these thinkers from, like, pretty recent history. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very, it's hyper-rational. It's, yeah. it's almost deterministic, right? Right. But there's a whole other word out, world out there uh, that... that um, our logical faculties are incapable of describing, yet we still want to limit people in terms of that language, in terms of what they're allowed to think or believe, right? Yeah. And it's like there are experiences you can have that are beyond words and that you will fail any debate with anybody because you can't adequately describe them. But that doesn't mean that they don't exist and that they aren't real. Yeah. It just means that we no longer are in a place where we can accept those types of arguments. And so you sound stupid when you make them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's a very good point. And it kind of goes back to what Max was saying earlier about, you know, sort of the boundaries and that, you know, belief kind of pushing beyond those boundaries. Yeah. We No matter like what point of time you find yourself in, there are boundaries as to what we understand or can do yeah. that are going to be broken in the future. And that's unfathomable point. to yes. the society of the time. <laughs> totally. And their minds can't yeah. even wrap around how one could achieve such a thing. Right. There's something, I don't know if it's faster than like travel or something that t to us today is just seems like that, dude, that's impossible. There's just yeah. no freaking way that can be done. Well, that someone yeah. through belief will break a barrier like that at some point. But not just that. That it's not just through belief. It's not just them through their belief that they will do it on their own. It's that them standing on the shoulders of yes. all those who believed before them. Great point. Going back tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years. And then finally, sure, sure, um, Buzz Aldrin or um, Armstrong, Neil, yeah, Armstrong. Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong was the first to like step on the moon. But you're right that 10,000 years ago, there was probably somebody who believed that they could do it. And Neil Armstrong, I must say Lance Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, totally not different Lance. dude. Um, <laughs> Neil Armstrong would never have gotten there had he not stood on the shoulders of those who believed before him. Yes. Um, I, I also, if we're talking about belief, um, it's so easy to denigrate those of the past 
who had a belief that you don't agree with, but we do stand on their shoulders, right? Mm-hmm. Like their beliefs about what's possible may be misguided or misdirected, uh, but the belief itself, you have to respect it because it's what got you where you are currently. Right. You know, thousands of years of the beliefs of the past got you to where you are, and you can't just discount that and say that you did it yourself. Right. Uh, they illustrated this so well. Yeah. Um, in the outer wilds, right at oh the end, gosh, right yes. where they showed all of those skeletons, and you turn away and look again, yeah, and, and there's they're more. stacking on top of yeah, each other, yeah. reaching towards the light. Anyway, okay, there's one more thing I want to say though, because you don't have to be the one to achieve the thing; you can still help the thing be achieved by believing in it sure. and adding to this whatever you call it in the world of people who believe and collective unconscious, whatever it is, that someone in the future will then be able to use that energy that you have from the past in order to motivate them to finally do it. Right. Now you're going to be considered stupid and be burned at the stake <laughs> and all that stuff, right? You're not they're not they're not going to remember you very well, but that person 10,000 years ago who thought he could walk on the moon was right. Yes. Even though he probably got made fun of and died a m- meaningless death. <laughs> well, fine, died n- never knowing whether well, that could have been achieved, exactly. but still believing it. But without without him believing, Neil Armstrong would never have done it. Yes. That's more or less my point. So even if you don't see the fruits of your labor, right, yeah. that you still are affecting the future by what you believe in today. Mm. Max, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, two things. First of all, I think it's worthwhile pointing out that we spent like the last 20 to 30 minutes talking about O, and he's like, makes up uh, of a 40-hour game, it's only like two or three minutes of the game, but it's probably like the most profound moment of the entire game. And it just goes to show just how amazing this game is, how amazing it is written that we can focus on this one element for this long and rightly so and talk about it. And the second thing, just to your point about how language and human constructed language is incapable of uh, being able to encapsulate uh, these profound concepts. I think that is latent in the guy's name. We say that his name is O. But it's not really O, because that presupposes that the universal divine language is English. Oh, you're right. You're right. So So. that's the way that we interpret his name. But his real name is like something else. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Whatever (laughs) happens when he opens his big mouth. Yeah. Right. Whatever sound it was that he made that humans can't make. But also the the letter O is a circle. It's It's a circle of eternity in and of itself. It's a Ouroboros. It's a container. It's infinity. It's it's all kinds of things. And then when they talk about how he opens his mouth and there's no teeth or tongue or it's just blackness. Well, that's the shape of a circle, though. You just open your mouth and it's like, ooh, this is who I am. And one of the things that that harkens to is the logos, right? Mm-hmm. That out of uh, that what proceeds forth out, forth out of the mouth of you know the divine is divine mm-hmm. speech, and and you're talking about the divine alphabet, and then he opens his mouth, and you're able to have this incredible experience. But the O, the circle, right? The the mystery of that is is kind of how it's um, given to you, and essentially it's 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 through the logos, but not through language, if that makes sense. Yeah. My next note here after O is about uh, Eb Creekness. He's another character here in the bar. Um, He's a retired member of the Harmonium, so I wanted to bring up the Harmonium real quick. Um, He offers his services uh, as a a tout for a fee since he has a disadvantage... Since he has a a disadvantage compared to other tour guides. Hmm. Sorry, he's... he's, I think who... I copied this wrong. (laughs) He has a lot of experience out there in the plains, Mm -hmm. and so he can tell you a lot about Uh, it. But he's like a tour guide that doesn't go anywhere with you. He just like talks to you about it. Well, that's to this game. That no, you know what? what I wanted that (laughs) is this game in a little nutshell. Yeah, you got a tour guide who just talks to you. He just tells you about stuff. He doesn't (laughs) actually show it to you. Exactly. Yeah, the old. That's the whole reason I wanted to bring it up. That's freaking funny. Um, Also, the name of the bar, Smoldering Corpse Bar, of course, is. Uh, Ignis, this person, this man who's burning in the middle of it. I I think we're going to talk more about Ignis later. I didn't recruit him at this time. Oh, me neither. Not until way I'm not sure if you can or not. Um, I think you can record, I I think you can recruit him a lot earlier than I did. Okay. But um, there is a certain item that you need from underground first because it's it's like that water that's like an eternal, holds like a water eternally in it or whatever that you have to like douse him with. In order to, like, actually recruit him. So, anyway, uh, we'll talk about him later, because that's actually one of the saddest 
most depressing yeah. stories, yeah. little stories in the game is like yeah. his origins and how they relate to the, the nameless one. But um, let's talk about the harmonium real quick. So yeah. uh, when we were talking about the mercy killers, they said the mercy killers and the harmonium kind of work together, almost like police or something like that. Uh, they're devoted to peace and harmony, but only under the terms they set. They act as enforcers of the law, policing sigil as they see fit. Uh, the Planar faction, known as the Harmonium, is actually just a small part of a much larger political entity which rules over the entirety of the prime material world of Ortho. In Sigil, they serve as the city's police force, and their headquarters is the city barracks. They are related to present-day authoritarianism, particularly religious evangelicalism and fundamentalism. Um, I think we'll also talk about the anarchist faction later because it's weird that he um, was like a farmer, a former harmonium officer, Eb Creekness, but now he technically belongs to the anarchist faction. So we'll return to that later. It's a very interesting fact. Okay, okay, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> but I think it's more important to get to Dak on here, who is a major character, a recruitable character in the yeah. game. Um, so he is a Gith Sarai. Uh, a people who live in limbo, where the form of matter itself can only be held together by concentration. This is like how his oh, weapon right. works, right? Yeah. Again, right. sort of belief being yeah. like the the way in which his weapon is actually effective or not. He has to yeah. be firm but in his like, convictions and beliefs. It's like belief, but like focused belief. Yes. Like concentration, like yes. a, a focused attention on something. A really cool yeah. weapon concept. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's almost immaterial or useless yeah. unless he can focus his belief and be sure in what he's doing, and then it forms into this yeah. solid blade, right? What's cool about that is that the, the sharpness of the weapon depends on the sharpness of the mind. Right? Yes. So there's kind of a parallel there. It's yeah. really fun. Yeah, and again, all kind of comes back to this belief that we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, like others of his race, he places a great emphasis on the holistic knowledge of things. Even the word no itself, he uses it all the time uh, when you're talking to him. He's always, he's always talking about know this or yeah. know that. Um, know thyself. Yeah. He used to be a Zerth, but is not knowing the teach, but in not knowing the teachings of Zerthanon, he left the city of the people. Um, quote from him here, my past is not known to you. So he's always using that in his mo mode of speech. My mm. past, and he puts emphasis on the word no. Mm. My past is not known to you. It is not my will that you should know it. Know that I bear the scars of one who has traveled the plains. Know that I have never t rested long in any one place. Know that I bear the weight of one who has traveled far to be in this place. Know that I am a Githserai. Know that I am of the people of Zerthanon. Know it was Zerthamon who knew the Githserai before we knew ourselves. He knew, um, so we should probably talk a little bit about their origins too, but um, he knew what had to be done to free us. From his knowing came action. From his knowing, freedom was born. The Githserai uh, ceased to be slaves and became a people. Know that I follow the unbroken circle of Zerthamon. His words are known to me. His heart is known to me. All that remains is to know myself. Uh, Zerthamon was like the first of their of this race of people. Is this the guy who went out in the field and found the there was like a piece of steel stuck in the yeah skull? and understood yeah. that steel was the weakness of the Flesh. mind flayers yeah, yeah. who were their so they were like a mindless race of people. Mm. that were like slave labor for these mind flayers, right? Yeah. Um, but Zerthamon was the first who sort of had self-awareness, yeah. like self-actualization, like an awakening, yeah. an awakening yeah. and, and sort of started to understand and to know things, which is why yeah. this is so built into their culture and their religion, mm. um, and understood that steel is stronger than the flesh Man, and that they I could wish fight back. I wish we knew the first human, <laughs> that same thing, for, for, but for humans. <laughs> that, yeah, like the first, like, Who's where the first? is that genetic line between yeah. whatever race we were before we right. were human, and then well, like the next mutation that made them into a human being. 2001, A Space Odyssey kind of sort of explored something yes. like that. Moon, yeah. moon, Moonwalker, Nightwalker, whatever the name yeah. of that 
character was. That that ape who touched the monolith and <laughs> the monolith became human. That's another thing that's going to be coming up in Dune is to what it means to be human versus an animal, oh, right? Yeah. The whole yeah, that's a big thing in Dune. Benny Gesserit oh, a test of the Gomjubar. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's a whole lot to, to delve into this. I and and here's the thing: a lot of people might not have talked. I should I Jackson? should say this. So after you recruit characters mm. and they're like now in your party, oh, you, you can, can still additionally talk to them, talk to them yeah. a lot, and you should throughout the whole game, yep. and get way more dialogue and learn way more about them. Yep. So there's a lot you, you can to, learn about. You have on. to remember to reselect them. You yes. have to deselect off of them and then select your person and then talk to them. But then you have to remember to click and drag and get your whole party before you go. <laughs> Otherwise, you will leave them leave behind and them. not realize that happened to me at least twice. <laughs> I was like, where's Mort? Where? Wow. Are you kidding me? He's just like sitting somewhere. Uh, you know. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you could miss. So I found out pretty much right away mm. because I was exhausting all the dialogue with Dakon. Yeah. Um, and there's actually another Gith character walking around outside the bar, I think, who... You, they start talking to each other and you can sort of tell mm. him, hey, translate what he's saying. And it's almost right. like he has to do what you say and that's suspicious. And the mm. guy, and he's like, well, basically I'm like your slave. Right. <laughs> you learn that Dakon is a slave to you because of a debt that happened in one of your previous incarnations right. where you saved him and he sort of swore an oath of allegiance to you until your death, not realizing that you're an immortal, which <sighs> means he's like, Screwed. He cannot <laughs> yes. be released from this, yeah. you know, like slavery he has to you, this, this bond he has with you. Um, and so you ask him to wait a minute, like explain how this happened. And so you can get a whole memory from that. That's right. Yeah. Where he was like drowning and you like rescued him yeah. um, and basically tricked him into this, like a devious former incarnation that yeah. was immortal, knew he was immortal and had him swear the oath knowing that yep. this would basically make him your slave. Um, so, yeah, crazy stuff. If you if you didn't do that, make sure next time you play the game, go read all that because it's fascinating yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's fun. Um, but Dakon's a great character, and I think we'll get a lot more into the circle of Xerthamon because um, you can actually translate them and like go through like different levels. The, the, like the whole thing is, it's like an item, right, in his inventory. Um, that you can use by going into the inventory, clicking and going to use, right? As yeah, long yeah, as you've gone right. through the dialogue and learned yeah. the teachings from him and whatnot. And then you can gain right. like the deeper knowledge and the history oh, yeah. of his people and all that. And then he'll like test you on what you learned from that. That's right. Like chapter or, or portion yeah. of the circle of Zerthamon. Um, so like their Bible is like a literal circle that you can kind of like uh, reveal layers of and like get more wisdom and knowledge from. Um, nice. Anyway, fascinating stuff. Um, I have any, to point anything out, that you guys have just taken the, notes on that we haven't touched on? The old maxim of know thyself. Yes. It's, it's very old. Um, it likely predates all Greek and Hindu philosophy going back all the way. Um, it's an old, old saying. I think for, uh, among the first Greek philosophers like Heraclitus, is he, he's got like a form of that in some of his writings fragments that have been discovered. So it's like this is they've been saying this kind of stuff for a very long time. Um, it's above the um, temple of Apollo mm. um, in at Delphi, I think. And then um, it's one of like three specific maxims of um, like the ancient Greek like belief system. Um, and know thyself. This harkens to the microcosm macrocosm thing that we often bring up. Um, what ancient people felt about the world, the universe, was that if you know yourself, you know the universe. Mm -hmm. The deepest part of yourself is like there's a correspondence between the depths of your soul, like the foundations of your being and the foundations of the universe itself. And that to truly know yourself is to simultaneously also truly know the universe and the cosmos as well. Yeah. And so they would, you know, they were very... Um, into this kind of thing. They would, you know, self-exploration and this kind of stuff. They were very into knowing themselves as best as they could. Um, and it seems like Dakon is more or less um, coming from that kind of philosophical angle. Yeah. 
Um, I think that makes sense. Yeah. And there's a form of know thyself, like basically in everywhere, like everybody, this is just old, 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 um, what would you call it? Philosophy kind of stuff. Um, but it harkens back to the concept of the, that humans are a microcosm of the universe. And mm. there, there is some way in which that is the case. Yeah. Scientifically, right. That an organism is a microcosm of its environment, basically, that you can learn about the environment by studying the organism itself. Right. Um, and absent in the environment even. And so there's something about that where to truly know and to understand everything about a fish is to also truly understand everything about like the ocean. Yeah, the, the um, particularly maybe even the, the part of the ocean they come that from. That specific Whether habitat. they adapt yeah. it to like deep, deep yeah, sea yeah. life with very little or yes. no light or whether they live amongst uh, reefs that are abundant in life and yeah. tons of predators around or whatever. Um, yeah, you can and, learn all that and stuff. And the lack of pressure as compared to yes, these exactly. yeah. freaking thousands of feet underwater. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, great point. Uh, yeah. Anything from you, Max, that we've missed from your notes? Yeah, I, I would just say that when I first played this game, I encountered Dakon, I think, in the third or fourth hour when I first started playing it. And when I first talked to him, it, it was sort of the first, because I talked to him before I talked to O, even though they're like standing right next to each other. Um, he was sort of talking him was sort of a microcosm of what to use your language of what the uh spirit of the entire game going forward was and it really set up for like the, the types of conversations and the types of uh in-depth philosophical discourse that you're going to be having from this point on um and the way that you recruit Dakon, um it really felt like a oh, i'm hearing myself again sorry let me turn it down uh, again there yeah. you go. it could be something else that's going on but yeah. Um, and when you recruit Dakon, the way that you recruit him, it really feels like you're making a philosophical effort to try and get him into your party when you're talking about um, whether or not the city of Sigil is flawed or not because it's constantly shifting, you know? And then when he finally joins you, it's just, yeah. I also kind of like how you almost have to outwit him or yeah, outbattle you him bit. philosophically yeah. in order to like yeah. convince him to come with you. I, yeah. uh, again, I, I, I think we already kind of talked about this last time, so I won't go over it again, but resolving conflicts through basically yeah. having more wisdom than people around you and then realizing <laughs> that is, <laughs> yeah. I just think, a brilliant way to kind of yeah. break the mold of every conflict is a fight, like a physical yeah, battle right. against something, which is what most video games are. Yeah. So I, I just really appreciate it. And that. this game can be that too. Yeah. If you sure, want it, certainly, if you want certainly, it to be. Certainly. Um, okay. I don't have that many more notes through the rest of what we're covering today, other than just like, uh, you know, this was really interesting to me or fascinating. But sure. as far as like deeper stuff, I don't have much. So I think we can get through the rest of this pretty quick. Um, I did have a note on the crier of S. Anon. Real no, quick. really? I don't know. Um, yeah. He's one of the last survivors of the destroyed city of S. Anon. Um, he can be found in the marketplace area of the hive. Uh, he and the other survivors are scattered across the plains, and they've taken up this duty, the sacred duty of constantly mourning the lost city. That's right. Acting as That's living right. memorials to it, right? Yeah. Yep. The crier is worried that if the precious few who remember it all die, the city will be forgotten. Right. And then, and you can, you know, offer your help. Uh, I think if you have like 14 intelligence, wisdom, or charisma, or something like that, or higher than that, um, you can advise him to either forget the city or to go find his brother so as not to be alone with the burden. Um, or another solution is you can suggest that a tombstone would be just as good to memorialize the city. You get like a better reward for doing it this way, right? Um, but this kind of comes back to, again, a, a sort of a recurring topic purpose, we have right. on, the, on the podcast, which is... Um, there, there's a certain amount of uh, of uh, a block of your own progression and growth as yeah. a person that comes from attachment to things. Oh, totally. so not yeah. being able to let go of things, not right. being able to wrestle with the concept that things are impermanent. Right. There's nothing that is permanent. Right. And and you're going to encounter that so often in your life and and, and it uh, in every aspect whether that's losing a person you love, something like that that is that deeply meaningful and personal and and um like important or 
whether or not your favorite gaming franchise changes to the point <laughs> at which you can't recognize it anymore and you uh, just are no longer interested, right? right. Like something as trivial <laughs> as, as that. Yeah, yeah. You're always going to be encountering the concept of impermanence, right. which is in itself a microcosm of the battle you have to do with the wrestling of your own mortality, your own sure. impermanence, yeah. which is why I think people struggle so badly with the pain that comes from losing something they cared it's about. It's like losing part of yourself. It's like a realization you're going to lose your yeah. own life as well yeah. eventually. And we don't That's like true. facing that. It's, no, it's <laughs> again, it's against the intuition or the instinct yeah. against the nature of, I'm well, the game says a man, but of people, <laughs> men and women, everybody. Um, it's against our nature. And, I don't know. I, I, I just, I, there, there's, so there's this balance between what the dustmen are saying is mm -hmm. what I'm getting to and this crier of yeah. S. Anon, right? Where you can live your life loving, appreciating your life, living it to its fullest, enjoying it while mm -hmm. it's there, but also not being so attached that you can't move on when you right. lose something because you're going to lose everything at some point. Right. And being able to appreciate the time you had with it, but be able to move on and continue to love and appreciate the life you're given. Like Seer was saying, you know, we should appreciate the life we're given, right? Like, is, is it yeah. really true that we should, that this life is just a burden all the time? Yeah, yeah. So somewhere in between these two is what I'm saying. Uh, S and on the criers of S on and as one set of the extreme that mm -hmm. is like, your life's going to be a misery if you live like this, right. always but, but, living in but. the past. But those people do have a purpose. But they, they have, have purpose. purpose. It's like my job is to cry and I have a reason to do this every right. day. But also, you can't be so dispassionate yeah. that you your life was literally wasted. Right. <laughs> so there's something in between those two, right? But the, again, the, the game is always pushing everything to its furthest extreme. Um, okay. Anything before we get to like the Dead Nations and the Rat Collective? Anything you guys got? previous to that not me uh i do have something but i'll just save it for the end perfect for the end okay um here's one thing that i, I guess i guess it's a criticism of the game um i, I i'm not gonna be I, i'm not like it's not like a huge deal it's just something that is a, a little unfortunate as a byproduct of this being a game from the late 90s and you you can't make a player spend the amount of time in a place to give the weight to it that they're trying to give to it yep. in the story, whether that's mazing, which oh. is some people get lost in those mazes <laughs> yeah. literally until they die, they never right. escape. Right. The Dead Nations is this city underground after you've come down and met Farad and he sent you after the Bronze Sphere. So you're down in those catacombs looking for the Bronze Sphere and you stumble into the Dead Nations and they come to you and they say, okay, you can stay here, we won't kill you, but right. you can't leave. Right, you right, literally right. have to stay here until you die. Okay, yeah. bye. And they walk away. That's the that's the rule. That's the law here. And and that can feel like, oh my gosh, like that can feel really heavy. But literally within 30 minutes you've left. <laughs> like like and the, it wasn't the, even the, that big a deal. The real weight yeah. to to that kind of like piece of the lore is unfortunately lost by the fact you're playing a game and you don't want your players to literally be stuck in the dead nations for longer than 30 minutes <laughs> which is or else it's boring this, this whole game is is the dead nations as far yeah. as i can tell but it's funny that there's another even deeper an underworld to yeah. this world right that's hilarious well um, then it goes even deeper that the nine yeah. hells of batar or right. batar or whatever that's right but, yeah yeah so what you're saying if i can paraphrase is that you you hate this game and, <laughs> and anyone anyone who likes it is stupid <laughs> it's uh, mostly what you just said i'm so, sure somebody anyways. will think that um no what that's, were you going to say? That's all I got, okay. actually. Yeah, no, I just thought it was a, a little bit of the weight of some of these really cool mm -hmm. world concepts is lost in the fact that they, they can't actually trap you in a maze. Yeah, for that, that you one. can't escape. The maze is, it's funny because you will, I think every now and then you'll actually meet people in the maze who've been there for a while. Yeah. Um, and it's like, okay, it's like, it's not that easy always, but it's not that hard. Like, like. Right. They, ten, they build it up tops, as if it's this maybe this three. lady of pain, this immensely powerful, yeah, probably the most yeah. powerful being in all the planes, decides yeah. to maze you, 
and that's like and a, it's that's not like that bad. The same as a death sentence. <laughs> yeah, for some people. And yeah, it's not that. And hard people have like made a camp and they've like built things in the maze, you know. Yeah. And it's just like, dude, you have like three rights and a left, and you're out. <laughs> right? I don't know. I'm like, how long did you just give up? Did right. you give up that fast? Right. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying. It it, yeah. it it makes this scale and scope and immensity of the world sort of it diminishes it a little bit. Yeah, but I I, there's no way around it. So that's why I don't want to be too hard on it. Well, yeah. But I love yeah. the concept of stumbling into this place and all these skeletons and ghouls yeah. and zombies who you've been fighting the whole time down here, that they'll be totally cool with you living with us, but just, you can't leave. You gotta yeah. stay here. And it's like, oh, crap. I, I almost <laughs> felt like this was payment. It was like, we aren't yeah. supposed to be alive, yeah. right? So the dead are like reclaiming us. Yeah. Like, hey, you're not, you're supposed to be dead. So like, we're gonna keep you here now. Yeah, but there were several things that you can do here that I loved. There's the guy with the riddles, um, oh, yeah. And he, he, there's one guy you talk to. He's like, "Oh, I can't solve this riddle." He told me this riddle, and he mm -hmm. tells you what it is. And I'm like, "Ah, oh, for the life of me, I can't figure it out." And if you have high enough intelligence, mm -hmm. or not intelligence, probably wisdom, or maybe the combination of the two, you can solve that riddle. And then uh, the guy who gives the riddle, oh, please don't go tell that other guy. Like, I don't want him to know. I, I, I like to see him like struggling so <laughs> bad with right. it. Like, there's a lot of <laughs> personality right. to this place. Oh, yeah. uh, of all places in the game, mm -hmm. the dead nations, skeletons and zombies yeah. and ghouls have this real personality and character that is just it makes it a very endearing place almost. Yeah, it's like one of the one of the few places in the game. That if I were to choose to live somewhere, it'd almost be there. Wow! I mean, outside of say like the higher planes, we never go to. Oh, okay, sure. But I'm talking about of the locations we actually visit in this game. Yeah. They're all pretty horrible. Yeah. They but are. the Dead Nations is pretty peaceful, all things considered, hmm. and they live in harmony. And hmm. they actually have people with personality there <laughs> that are <laughs> kind of funny. funny and that I can relate to. And they're all dead people, which yeah. goes on with the same theme mm. we've been talking about, about these reversals yeah, yeah, that's that right. they've been trying to do the whole time. The, 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 the skeletons and the zombies are just these aimless, mindless enemies for you to cut down. No, right. in here they're intelligent and they give riddles to each other and they philosophize and think about life and or what whatever the life they actually have now which is not really life it's something <laughs> else and they have leaders and yeah. they're they're trying to maintain a peace here with a concept of a ruler who's not even alive the yeah. silent king has been dead uh, but the silent king has to be a person who's alive so the person who sits in that throne has to be a living person mm. no other dead person here can just take the throne now mm. And you can actually sit in that throne, but the the it, it would essentially equate to a game over because oh. you're stuck in it. The person who sits in it has to oh. sit there until they die. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but they become the silent yeah, king and they rule right. okay, until yeah. they die. But then once they die, they don't have a silent king. So they, yeah. they pretend this silent king is still there to keep all of these factions of the dead nations uh peaceful so that they're not fighting each other or whatever oh, that's, that's kind of how they, they maintain mm -hmm. their illusion of a, a, a peaceful society by lying <laughs> about the fact that this dead this silent well, king is still there they call that the noble lie that's what yeah what that's exactly what it, it is yeah. it's the noble lie yeah. and not only does it keep their society functioning it keeps their enemies from attacking them oh there you go right because hey, you can re you can actually go to the cranium rat mm -hmm. collective to many as That's one right, yeah. the leader the hive yeah. mind leader of the cranium yeah. rat collective and you can tell them that the silent king is dead or if you went there before you went to the dead nations you can go on a mission to kill the silent king right and if you report that it's like oh we can attack them now i right? do remember this yeah I so this. just really really fascinating yeah, stuff. Very and then there's another guy there he's one of the dustmen um, so Suego, I think I his go. name is. Yeah. Um, and he's there and he's, you know, mm. basically he's where rat cause he's part of the rat collective. That's what it was. And he was spying. <laughs> that's right. He's, he's that's like playing right. double agent this. in all these different this. places. Yeah. So he's yeah, like he's spying the on the dead nations, yeah. but he's also kind of like used to belong to the dustmen, but now he's not loyal to them anymore, but he yeah. can still take on the form of mm. a dustman. So there's like, so you were kind of sent there this. by Emmerich to like find out what's going on with that. It was an investigation on where these dead bodies are coming from mm, that from they're Farrow. selling to the mortuary that are like, anyway. Yep. There's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, and so there's a little quest where you can kind of like reveal who he really is. He's actually one of these yeah. were rats who's a spy among them and that gives you favor with 
uh, some of the characters, and then you can eventually find your way into where the Dead King is at, and le- or the Silent King, and learn the yeah. truth of what's going on there. Um, but the Cranium Rat Collective was also really yeah. fascinating. Fascinating, yeah. The hive mind, the, the rats are stronger. Yeah. The more of them there are. So if you encounter... That's genius. Yeah. If you encounter a room with a lot of rats in it, you, you want to try and draw like one of them out at a time. Yeah, don't fight the, them all at once. Each, each one you kill dis, like diminishes the strength yeah. of the group yep. to the point where it becomes safe. But if you try to attack them all at once, it's like they're the strongest enemy you, in the game. You almost. can um, you can fight many as one. Right? Yes, yes, you can. I, can anyone possibly win? Or uh, you can just, win. You can. Oh, I it didn't is know possible. That. Oh, okay, but I don't. I'd love to see that. I wouldn't have been able to do it at oh, my no, level when I was there. But uh, yeah, I mean, it is possible. I yeah. read that it is possible. So many as one is a pretty cool concept. Um, it's basically the concept of what is currently becoming. AI, what we know of as like sure. chat GPT and whatnot, that you get all of these um, low level mundane inputs and through the collection of all of it and the, you know, sifting through and parsing through all of the data, you get a large language model that's capable of basically like thinking and writing out stuff. And then the more input it has, the more people click the stupid captchas and the more people like, you know, just uh, blurt out their thoughts to the public, uh, the smarter this thing gets. As stupid as those thoughts might be, Mm -hmm. this thing gets smarter and smarter and it grows bigger and bigger. Um, And there's another element of like the wisdom of the crowds kind of in this as well that we talked about recently. Um, You know, maybe uh, one person may not have a good idea of what's going on, but the collective of the people actually can, you know, make a pretty accurate guess as to the weight of the pig or whatever it is. Right. I also really liked, um, there were like these faces on the walls in the catacombs that were people who had been like um, cursed or oh, yeah. punished somehow. I do remember And they have these mouths that just spill this filthy, disgusting right. sewage all the time. Yeah. He's like, if you could just please release me from this I do remember horrible this. sewage. And the, the guy who cursed him thought it was funny and well, that then was, he curses that, you. That was oh, also that a- um, Requind, okay, who was cool. a character up That's right. That's in another right. place. Yeah, we'll talk about and that later. <laughs> the person who cursed him is a character we'll meet in the next episode. Okay, okay, okay. But... Um, I don't know if he was the one. He could have been the one who also cursed these people. I don't remember. It's got his little signature. Details, but uh, you get an you get like this uh, item which holds, like I was saying, this sort the of water. eternal clean yeah. water, and that's what you can help him. So there's just all these little cool yeah, things and little quests that just fill this world out and make it feel so big and immense and just just full of like possibilities it's like a, yeah. a really good fantasy world that i guess that's my oh, mark yeah. for what a good there fantasy again. world is is not one that literally in like ad nauseum just like explains every single thing about it yeah. but gives you just a taste yeah. in these little stories and these little pieces that make you imagine yeah wow this must go so much further you almost fill in that's right. This that's world right, yeah. for the author, in a sense, they yeah. they hint at it, and your imagination like begins to the world, fill yeah. in and make it bigger than it actually is. Ooh, it's a co-creative work yeah. between you and the yes. and the author. That's fun. yes, I like and that. so this game does that really brilliantly. Yeah, with just all these I little agree. stories that they tell with the quests. Um, but the last thing that I even had to talk about was the tomb of the Nameless One, which yeah. is filled with traps because. So he's he's paranoid about the, this previous incarnation. Mm. Was paranoid about someone who was chasing him everywhere, trying to kill him. He right. always finds me. He always kills me. No matter where I hide, how long I hide, he always will find a way to find it's me. A this big mystery. Big mystery. Me, right? Yeah. Um, but you also, I think, the most shocking thing of all that stuff you read, because really all those messages kind of create more questions than they actually they answer. They do, especially the one that um, says, don't trust the don't, flying, that was the, one. The, the talking skull, yeah. That was the one that was like, <laughs> oh, man. And that was a really, yeah. that's a really brilliantly executed moment. I it think. was, because it was the tattoo on your back. Yes. Minus that one Minus the line. one line that yeah. Mort decided not to say. Yes. And that just immediately makes you so suspicious yeah. of him. Yeah. And And this character who was you almost imprinted on in a sense because yeah, you were totally. the first He's our being leader. that yeah. you found yeah. in this life <laughs> who you've been trusting and, and totally. listening to and he's been telling you the things you don't yeah. know and filling Expositing. in gaps for you yeah. and like helping you with advice and like they turn you on him in this moment because yeah. he did not mention 
this one part of that tattoo and you can go but, confront him right away yeah. and he's not very good at responding no. to that confrontation he doesn't do himself any favors in <laughs> responding to it um but what if he did say that when we first woke up yeah right anyways yeah we'll we'll, we'll, we'll it, get this, more this into is that. going somewhere so. yes exactly but i just thought it was a really brilliantly executed yeah, moment it, it, it's one of the ones that goes like oh crap can i trust this guy like Oh my gosh, there's all this stuff I don't know. Who should I trust? Mm. It's really, really, really good. Yeah, it's fun. Um, so anyway, you get the bronze sphere. You go back up to Farad, give it to him. You could have either recruited Anna earlier, or if you hadn't, she'll kind of come into the party yeah, at this point. Yeah, I think point. this is when I got And it. she promises to take you to the place where she found you dead, so that you can right. continue investigating who you are and figuring it out. So... That's it, as far right. as my notes. What do you guys got? Um, there's not much else for the end there. What you got, Max? Um, I just think that before we conclude, it might be worthwhile just talking about the Nameless One and what the whole ongoing discussion surrounding that character is going up to the end of the game. Like, who is the true Nameless One? And, you know, even though the whole t game from this point on, he's going to be seeking out his true identity, that true identity is going to become further and further as he experiences the world around him and individuates away from those original identities and then trying to discover like okay so who is the new true nameless one is it me is it this old guy is it who he is now like and it's all like a reinvention of that old um thought experiment by plutarch and the ship of theseus um yeah do you want me to explain what that so is I, for people yes, might, as, might as well do it just in case there's someone in the audience who has not heard of it Sure. So for, I, I don't think it was Plutarch that coined the thought experiment, but he was the one that first recorded it. So the ship of Theseus, it was what uh, King Theseus traveled on to go defeat King Minos and save a whole bunch of children that were uh, kidnapped by him and then brought them back to safety. And since that time, uh, this is back in ancient Greece, obviously, um, and it's mythical because we're talking about a minotaur. Um, the 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 ship was preserved over time because they wanted it to be a landmark to which people can visit and appreciate what was done. But naturally, because the years are going to go by, the parts of the ship are going to wear down. So you have planks replaced, you have bolts replaced, and all that. At one point, at what point though, does the original ship of Theseus not be the original ship of Theseus, or is, are we asking the wrong question here? Was there ever an original ship of Theseus, or is it like? I think it was Heraclitus that suggested this, that a, a thing's identity is something that is consistently evolving from moment to moment to moment. So it's like, yeah, that whole discussion about what is identity. And that's uh, something that's going to be going all the way up until the end of the game. It is. Because there's been so many different lives that have been lived. And, and this is more like his mind or soul or who is this person? Yep. Not so much the body, because it is the same body, though it has been mutilated and very much so <laughs> cut apart and had probably parts replaced in in a certain yeah. sense but for the most part this is still the same body but it's more like the mind more the the essence of the person yeah like at what point of dying and losing that last person that you were are you the same right and and are you responsible that's the real for the yeah. con or do you, are you responsible for the actions of that person should the consequences of the choices of that other person before should you be responsible for them i think is a big question right if that's not you then yeah. who who's responsible for what that guy did <laughs> yeah right so i think um I think we'll definitely talk more about that. Yeah, that'll on. be fun. And yeah. it's not just there because you've got like kind of the, the mind or the spirit or the soul. You've got the body. You've also just got the identity, which is the name, right? Yeah. And what, what is it about the ship of Theseus that keeps it being the ship of Theseus after every part of it has been replaced with modern something else? It's the name. It still has the name. It, yeah. We still call it the ship of Theseus. So That's, it's the ship of Theseus. I'm so glad it's you said that. It's the identity. Because in... I forget it. The the it's not Ragpicker Square, but it's the little village where all the people that Farad rules over. Oh right. right. There's a whole quest there where someone lost his name. Did you do this quest? Yes, I did. And yeah, it, yeah. There's, and there's, there's get it for him. power in a name. Oh, very And this much other so. person was like, "No, I I found it. Uh, it like yes. it's mine now. Like t 
tell that person. You go back There's and no forth need to between get angry. them. Yeah. yeah, you go back and forth between them and try to convince this person yeah. who now has their own name plus this person's name. It's like th- this <laughs> well, guy can't live without his name. Like, yeah. you have to go give the name back to him. There's also this ancient, ancient idea where if somebody knows your true name, they can hurt you. Yeah. They can curse you. In fact, uh, this is something I wasn't going to bring up till later. I probably still will bring it up later. But you, you almost you don't exist in the world of sociality unless you have a name. Mm-hmm. You, you're like a ghost. You're like you're not in the social world, right? Because nobody can pinpoint you. Nobody, nobody can categorize you. Nobody knows exactly. So they say nameless one, and you say nameless one. Well, that that will eventually become his name if he doesn't find a name. Yeah. Because what the people, what the social world refers to him as, is what he will be known as, right? Yeah. And so he needs to go find the name, right? Because otherwise, there, there's a sense in which he almost doesn't even exist until he, until has, a he name. has a name. And the social world is essentially like the world of our experience. It's right. it's almost everything. Yeah. I'm so glad you said human. that because I would have totally skipped over that whole little name yeah. quest. And I think it's really important so, to and this whole thing. This is a, you know, religious ceremonies will do this as well. But like the naming of a child is a big deal. It's a huge like, deal. It's a deal. It's a thing, right? And you know, uh, often like for the Catholic Church, when children are baptized, sometimes they're given like a new name, like a, a the name of a saint or something like that mm-hmm. when they're baptized. And it's uh, it's not just that you get this ritual or a ceremony that's performed. You also receive a new name, right? right? And the naming of something is like its birth into this new world, right? It's like a rebirth. Gosh, this crosses over a birth so into much the world with of Dune. It's unbelievable. I know. <laughs> It's unbelievable how much crossover there is with Dune and there's Planescape. There's a lot of... It's it, crazy. This always happens, though. Uh, it's true. I mean, <laughs> there's only a certain amount of stories that well, get told and I, retold that's, over that's and over true. and over again. But. but whenever we're doing some extra thing, like, the, the video game always somehow coincides. Coincides it's really with, funny. It, with it. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's it for today's episode. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for joining us again, Max. Yeah. Um, Anything else, Max, you want to say before we go? Uh, no, that was about it. Thank you. Okay, sweet. Um, so for next time, We've left the hive now. Uh, We're going to be basically starting in the Tenement of Thugs, I think is the name of it. Ah, So you're going to play through that up to the lower uh, wards, then up to the clerk's ward, all the way up into, well, let's just say play up all the way until you leave Sigil. Let's just say that. Very good. Um, So at the point where you end up in Ravel's Maze, I think, is when you would stop. For next episode. And then right. the final episode will be Ravel's Maze to the end of the game. Okay. So that's what we'll be discussing next time. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Peace out. <laughs>